Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Today's show is the second of my six part series of Australian wines, four of which were donated to me by one of my Instagram followers, Jason Carley, shortly after I took my advanced exam last year. I had posted on social media about not passing the exam and that I would be resuming my study shortly afterwards. So thank you, Jason, for your generous donation. Lewin Estate. Many would consider this an iconic Australian winery, and this wine is their flagship, their most famous, and it could be considered as one of the best, if not the best, Chardonnay from Australia. So no pressure here for me or for them. So who or what is Lewin Estate? Well, let's let Google Earth show us. For this little aerial tour, I learned some new tricks to make a part of this look more like I use a drone. I'm still figuring it all out, but it's a different look than I would normally do. This flyover is somewhat best guess as to the entire property. I didn't put any property lines down as I'm not exactly sure where they would be, so some of what is flown over may not be their land. Plus, as I fly along what I think is their property line, you'll see other vineyards and open fields. All right, the estate is located in Western Australia. This is a place often forgotten by people as South Australia, Victoria, and New South Wales tend to get all the attention. The Margaret River is a fairly large region on the far southwestern tip of Australia. With that said, only slightly more than 5,000 hectares are planted out of a total of 425,000 hectares for the entire region. That's the equivalent of 4,255 square kilometers or 1,642 square miles. It has a Mediterranean climate and is compared to Bordeaux in a dry vintage. It is very dry from October to April, which is their growing season. Only about 3% of Australia's total wine production comes from here, but at least 20% of Australia's premium wine comes from here. Luna Estate was founded in 1973 by Dennis and Tricia Horgan, who still own it today. Their children, Justin and Simone, currently are joint CEOs. It was originally a cattle station after having been purchased as part of a deal to buy a plumbing business by Dennis in 1969. The land was converted to vineyards based on the advice of the Western Australian Department of Agriculture. Back in 1972, Robert Mondavi provided significant advice during the planning and setup phases of the estate. He had contacted them to promote the potential of the Margaret River wine region. Luna Estate produces about 60,000 cases and owns 121 acres or almost 49 hectares. This wine is part of their art series. There are a total of five wines that are part of this series. The rest are made from Cabernet Sauvignon, Shiraz, Riesling, and Sauvignon Blanc. Each wine carries a new painting for each new vintage. They have two other lines of wine called Prelude Vineyards and Siblings. Prelude is intended to be more of a drink now type of wine. I believe Siblings is also intended to be drank upon release. Their website just says, the Siblings label celebrates the family lineage of Lewin with four generations now leaving their footprints on the estate. If you visit them, they also have an art gallery. It has over 150 paintings and artworks from different Australian artists. From what I can tell, these are all the art series labels, actual artwork, plus other pieces of art they have collected over the years. And many of those were used with permission on their labels. Many of the paintings and sculptures were commissioned by the winery, but not all of them. In addition to the art gallery, they also have a restaurant, do special events on the property, and you can even charter a plane from an airport in Genicott, Perth, and land at their airstrip. You'll get a scenic one-hour flight. I know what I'm going to ask for when I finally make my trip down under. Can you imagine the video I could get from that? If you guys at the winery are watching, that would be a cool experience to get on camera. This seems like a good time to mention that I've resurrected my merchandise line. I've retired the 1337 wine line, but now I have my WWTV and my hashtag outstanding line of merchandise. The hashtag outstanding line is all about positivity and is based upon my response of outstanding when asked how I'm doing. I have polos, t-shirts, and accessories on Zazzle. Those are really for the WWTV side. 
Check out this sweet polo. The outstanding line is all t-shirts. So far, I only have a small number of variations of t-shirts for both lines with more to come. Link below in the description, so please check them out. All right, back to the wine. So the artwork for this wine was made by Kim Maple. Here's an image of her work I got from her website. Link below to her website, so check it out. It is titled Influence and is an oil on canvas painting. So who is Kim? She's been an artist since the early 1970s when she worked as a graphic artist. She got a diploma of fine art from the Perth Technical College during that time. She was mostly an illustrator until 1986 when she moved to Melbourne, pursuing a BFA at Monash University. She returned to Perth in 1994 with her family. She has done a lot of traveling throughout the Margaret River region, along with the Southwest Kari, which are mainly eucalyptus trees of Southwest Kari forests. Her artwork is a reflection of these travels. Anyway, that trip probably won't be for a long time as for me to do it right, I would need to probably be in Australia for at least 21 days, maybe even an entire month. That's because I know I need to see as many of Australia's wine regions and wineries in that one trip, plus catch a couple tourist spots in major cities. It's like trying to see the entire United States in one trip, except with like three times the land mass. Just some rough napping math here. That's at least a $15,000 to $25,000 trip. So yeah, I gotta start making that YouTube cheese to afford that or you gotta buy these shirts. Realistically, I'd end up hanging out in the eastern part of the continent and the trip would be closer to two full weeks and that's still close to 10 grand. All this reading up on all the wines in this series is great and I'd want to visit every single winery. Plus check out my friend Sam Scapari's wine and restaurant he and I did a very long Skype call several years ago, which never lost a connection once. That was pretty amazing. All right, enough daydreaming. I got some wine to taste. Here are the stats of the wine. 2016 Lumina State Art Series Chardonnay, approximately 90 bucks US. On their website, it's $115 Australian, but that's for the 2017. It is 100% Chardonnay from the Margaret River GI, 13.5% ABV. The text sheet they sent me uh, is 13.9, so maybe it's actually 13.9. Barrel fermented for 11 months in new French oak, uh, regular lees stirring. Fining, now this is something a little unusual. Fining, they're using bentonite and PPV. This is one of the few times a tech sheet has listed this. I'll cover them in a minute. Final pH, uh, I got from the 2017 wine, which is 3.12. The final acid though for this one is 7.8 grams per liter, which was really close to the 2017 numbers. Filtration, 0 0.45 micrometers. I just thought it was a cool thing that they had. I've never seen this on a tech sheet, but I'm sure like winemakers would like really be geeking out about that. And they put their average bricks from 23.0 to 23.5 at harvest. Okay, so what are bentonite and PPVP? First, bentonite. Bentonite is a type of very fine clay made of aluminum silicate. It is distinct from other clays in that it is formed from volcanic ash. Bentonite is principally used to remove proteins from white wine and juice, as it is a negatively charged clay colloid and reacts with positively charged proteins, precipitating them from the wine. Science, right? PVPP, you ready for this? Polyvinyl polypyrrolidine, I said it right. PVPP is a synthetic polymer used to reduce the level of phenolic compounds associated with browning and astringency in white wine. It can also be used to remove pink color and pinking precursor compounds in white wine. PVPP is practically insoluble in wine and absorbs the low molecular weight phenolics, especially anthocyanins and catechins. PVPP is a gentle fining agent which preserves wine aroma, unlike some other fining agents. When used for color reduction in white wines, combining with carbon is more effective in many cases, as it helps with clarification of the carbon particles. <sighs> I know, I know, sounds crazy, right? It's not. Perfectly safe. I got both of these descriptions from the Australian Wine Research Institute's page on finding agents. The site also talks about milk, which was used in the 2017 version of the wine and other possible fining agents. The upshot to all of this is that these are common ingredients in order to make your wine clear, especially white wines as consumers want crystal clear white wines. I have a link below to the Institute's page on fining agents if you're feeling a little froggy. I'll probably make this a subject of a freestyle Friday at some point. Okay, enough with the tech talk. 
Let's talk wine. All right. <clears throat> so uh, all these Australian wines, I have like, I think all six of them are screw cap. And thank goodness I bought more of these Corvin screw caps a while back. Because I only had like two of them for like, I don't know, like a couple years. And then I knew I was going to do some Australian wines at some point. Actually, it might have been, I might have been, um, uh, because of these wines, I might have done it. Actually, no, I had uh, the underground cellar wines I was getting. And then these, too. Did you like that PVPP pronunciation? I think that was like take seven. Actually, I said it right for about three, the last three takes, but I kept messing up regular English. I really wanted to get that part all done in one take. By the way, uh, are you liking the fact that the beginning part, you know, I'm, I'm kind of being a little more succinct and I got the script and I mean, obviously you see the little cuts and all that, but you liking that? I'm liking it. I think it makes the, the show a little bit better. Okay. I'm going to wipe my nose. So I'm going to cut that part out. All right. I'm back from wiping my nose. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Um, so I checked the color. Now, uh, I've got my, I've got my DJI Osmo pocket hanging in the chandelier above the table so I can try to get some color. I'm assuming everything, I, I lined everything up beforehand. So anyway, let's take a look at the color. So it's kind of a lighter yellow. So I wouldn't necessarily call it straw, but there's definitely some uh, gold on the edges or one of my friends that says gold shoulders. So a little bit gold, a little bit golder color, golden color on the edge. That definitely is an indication. That definitely can be an indication of Chardonnay or some, you know, not just Chardonnay, but Chardonnay tends to have that color. I also, and again, this is probably the green screen behind me because I can see the actual green screen reflected, but there is a touch of green and green definitely is something that can show up in, um, in Chardonnay. All right. So let's check it out. So, yeah, I mean, it has kind of like an unmistakable Chardonnay aroma. So like we're two for two. As far as like if I was blinding this, I would smell this and be like, it's Chardonnay. Just have to figure out where. But we got some yellow apple on here. Got some orange. We've got some peach. We've got, um, yeah, that that green apple, yellow apple, green apple, but really the yellow apple more than anything else, a golden apple, right? There's a richness to the wine. So that's, the, that's that oak aging, 11 months. So you got some caramel, you got some vanilla, you got some baking spice. I mean, the, the oak aging is definitely prominent. It's 100% French New Oak. It's going to it's going to absorb this, right? You got a little bit of uh, mushroom quality to it. It's very light on the mushroom. There's an airiness to it. Like um, I don't know how to explain that. Ozone is probably not the right the right thing, but it's not like petrichor. It's not like that rainwater thing. But there's kind of an airiness to it. A little caramel, golden apple. Yeah, a little, a little bit of that, a little, a touch of like mushroom funk type of thing, right? I'm saying right, as if you're smelling this with me, but all right, let's taste this wine. So unmistakably Chardonnay. Now, how would I say this Australia? Well, there's a, it's kind of like how Oregon is the perfect marriage of old and new world and Pinot Noir for me. And it's somewhat like that for Chardonnay in Oregon, but it, and then while that more Oregon trip, I did have a decent amount of Chardonnay. I really haven't reinforced that very uh, very much since basically a year and a half ago. Not quite a year and a half ago. Well, by the time you watch this, a year and a half ago. So um, there is this kind of Burgundian quality to this. And I'll have to admit that when I was researching the wine, Burgundy came up pretty often. Not that I was looking for tasting notes, but it's kind of hard to avoid 100% if you're scanning through something and the word burgundy just kind of pops out. So there is a Burgundian quality to this and Oregon can also have that quality. I mean, we're at a higher elevation. Uh, this is going to be, uh, um, I mean, the climate wise, we're at a higher elevation, but, and I'm just going to go scroll back to make sure I get the, the climate right which actually I don't think I had the climate on here. Yeah. All right. So I, I basically fast forwarded me looking something up. So yeah, it said, it said it was the Mediterranean climate. So there's a warm climate to it. And Bordeaux is definitely not, it's more of a moderate climate, not really Mediterranean. And Oregon's, you know, same idea, moderate climate, kind of cool climate. So like I said, there's a richness to this. 
So it's not a, I wouldn't say this is a warm climate necessarily or a hot climate, but you can taste that kind of richness of the grape, the ripeness of the grape. And I think that's, that's where I'm getting that marriage of old and new world. So I kind of got a ripe burgundy. Yeah, there is definitely green in this, in this wine. I, again, green screen is re reflecting, but I, it, you can, you can definitely see green in this. Yeah. Yeah, that vanilla is there, that caramel, that golden apple, that green apple, that peach, that orange. And a little bit of hint of mushroom is in there. So if I was not paying attention, which, you know, I'm paying attention to the wine right now. If I wasn't paying attention, I would think this is, might be a rich, a richer or warmer vintage burgundy. I probably would not put this in California at all, unless we're talking super cool climate, which is totally testable. But, um, you know, as far as Chardonnays go, this is absolutely delicious. This is a Chardonnay that is extremely well made. If you find the Chardonnay, you know, it's going to cost you a pretty penny. Like it, it'll cost you anywhere between like 80, maybe you might be able to get as low as 70 in the US, but 90 bucks, don't, don't be surprised if it's $90. Okay. It is that good of a Chardonnay. It's excellent quality. I haven't had a lot of Australian Chardonnays, but I know the reputation of this estate is stellar. So yeah, you should not be like concerned if you're like, oh, I'm going to go out and limb and try an Australian Chardonnay. And this is the one you pick. You're, you're you're fine, okay? You're you're not going to be disappointed at all. Now, with that said, if you're looking for the really heavily oaked butter bomb, no, this is not that. If you're looking for that style, that's really indicative of California or is kind of stereotypical of California then this is not that wine. However, there are those richer, you know, bolder elements with the oak that's in there. Uh, the acid is pretty high. Uh, I am gonna scroll back real quick to look at the acid because I remember it being, yeah, I mean, a final pH of 3.12 for 2017. It can't be much more different than that. I mean, the acid is 7.8. This is Something I didn't say, I didn't see it in the actual uh, vinification notes or the actual text sheet. I might've missed it, but I'm going to guess that it didn't go through any mallow. If it did, it was a little bit, maybe a partial mallow lactic that softens out the acid. But this acid's, this acid's high. It's not screaming high as, the, as that um, Riesling I did, but this is, this is a high. This is almost like a, maybe like a Grand Cru Chablis that sat in oak, which is not uncommon. Hence that green apple that was, that was in there too. It's a great wine. I mean, it, it's something you should buy. If you can, if you can afford the money, you should buy it. Jason, you knocked it out of the park. We're two for two. One, well, I'm two for two for like smelling the wine going, yeah, of course it's this, but then I also have the answers in front of me, but two for two, you know, sending me outstanding wines. They'd never had the Pusey Vale. I've maybe had the art series once in my life. Um, so this is, these are wines that are definitely not going to go to waste for studying purposes, for sure. Absolutely delicious wine. And let me let me caveat this, or let me kind of qualify this. Chardonnay is not my favorite grape. Chardonnay is not my favorite wine. Chablis is my favorite expression of Chardonnay. And this is a richer version. I wouldn't really put this as, I would never call this Chablis. It's really not as steely and flinty and doesn't have that, 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 that sulfurous quality that Chablis can really have. Though I don't drink a lot of Grand Cru Chablis. So the oak would probably be like, okay, but this is, I think like a much richer version of Burgundy, but I mean, it's Australian. And I think this is where I take this wine and I really delve into it and come up with why it's not everything else. Therefore it must be Australia. And that's what our deductive tasting grid teaches us is not to guess what it is, but what it's not. And then whatever it's not is what's left over is what it, probably is. And if sometimes it's singularly, you know, it has to be that like something like Chardonnay or something like Riesling, if we know it's not from certain areas, then how we can only come from one area. When we're confused about the grape, then we just kind of reduce it down to like, well, it's a group of these three grapes. And then we just go, well, if it's these three grapes, then it can only come from these areas. And we know which areas those should be, even if it's like, say something like Riesling from Europe, it can come from three places. Well, there's things about that reasoning that take us to different areas. 
So that's how deductive tasting works for us. It's somewhat a bit of a parlor trick. I mean, because we are at the end of the day guessing, but we're making educated guess. If you wanted my thoughts about that, watch my uh, proposal to change the uh, quartermaster solvingase testing from a few weeks ago. You'll get my full perspective on tasting and why we do it and why we should change it. Anyway, enough of that soapbox. Uh, wine's great. You should buy it. So that's going to do it for today's show. Again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and then tell all your friends. And until next time, we'll see you later. Cheers. Thank you, Jason.